Good afternoon, everyone. So I am the policy director from the Office of the Independent Monitor in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I'm going to present some work that my co-author, uh, Dr. Matt Butis, and I did uh, back in 2014 and, and talk about the sort of um, ramifications of that work and, and some of the challenges um, that we faced in looking at the implement implementation of a body-worn camera project. Um, and you, this project focuses largely on policy, and so I think um, you'll see some really common themes in the work that we did and, and the work that Maria is talking about, which I think should lead to a nice conversation. Um, so the Office of the Independent Monitor, uh, we have uh, five main responsibilities. We conduct outreach to communities and law enforcement. We make recommendations for improving policy practices and training, and that's largely what today's presentation is about. Uh, we monitor officer-involved shootings and in-custody death investigations. We monitor and make recommendations on, on internal affairs investigations and disciplinary findings. And then we have a mediation program in which we try to cultivate um, community member and officer dialogue um, when there's been a, a conflict um, or a complaint. Um, so in 2014, the Denver Police Department piloted a body-worn camera project. So I'll give you a little bit of the chronology and, and some of the details um, because they're useful for background. Um, so we have six patrol districts in Denver, seven if you count the airport. Um, this project focused on District 6, which is the district that patrols downtown Denver. Um, so sort of the tourist area as well as the area where the restaurants and bars and clubs are. Um, so a little bit different from the rest of Denver when you're looking at a program like this. Uh, and so the body-worn camera pilot project went on for about six months, the, the, roughly the last six months of 2014. Um, the patrol officers were outfitted with cameras. The supervisors weren't. So if you're a sergeant, a lieutenant, and obviously command staff, um, they were not assigned to, to wear body-worn cameras during the pilot project. Uh, the project was, was um, the pilot period had a t what was called a testing and evaluation policy. It's a long document and I won't get into the details, but I think the important part of that policy was that officers were required to activate their camera prior to any officer-initiated field contacts and for a broad range of calls for service. So really any time they could where it didn't present a safety issue, there was no discipline in place at the time, right, because this was only one, it was a pilot project in one district. They couldn't impose discipline um, on one district and not the others. Uh, and during that time, 80 uses of force were reported. Uh, in that six-month period, that roughly six-month period. And so we were really interested in looking at those 80 uses of force because I think a primary role of body-worn cameras is, is to capture uses of force and provide sort of objective accounts of, of um, you know, what type of resistance could be seen, what the officer's perception was, and why the officer chose to respond in the way that he or she did. So. The, the sort of field of research around body-worn cameras is very interesting. I think like a lot of technology in policing, we've seen this kind of massive, um, this rush to implementation and, and, you know, the research has sort of followed suit. So we haven't really set up an evidence base at the front and then tested cameras and made sure that they work and then put them out. Um, but I think a lot of people have bought into them for really obvious reasons. I think that, you know, body-worn camera programs, I think we all can agree, are generally positive programs. Um, most of the research that's currently out there focuses on the quality of officer and citizen interactions and uses of force. Um, I cite Cynthia Lum and her colleagues here not because they did that research, but because they wrote a really nice piece where they sort of stepped back and looked at the research that's gone on in the past couple of years and said, you know, here's what we know some stuff about, here's what we know a lot about, and here's where there are big gaps in the knowledge. So I'm drawing pretty heavily from that work on this slide. Um, Body-worn cameras, we know they're related to decreases in complaints and uses of force. I think from the, you know, kind of seminal research on Rialto, California, done by Barack Ariel and his colleagues, um, and some more recent research that's come out of places like Orlando and Arizona, um, we've seen these, these sort of decreases that come along with the implementation of a body-worn camera program. Um, some research has found quicker resolution of complaints. Um, more proactive policing and less invasive policing, so, you know, more issuing of citations, less stop and frisk, uh, so positive things like that. Um, improved case processing, higher likelihood of charges and convictions, um, so also a good outcome, although I will point out that that, that piece of research was uh, focusing primarily on domestic violence cases, but it does point to the utility of the body-worn cameras for sort of agencies that work alongside the police as well as the police. 
Um, the big gap here is that there hasn't been much research on implementation and organizational concerns, and so I think there's, um, there's a call out right now to really try to fill some of that research, and I hope that this research um, fills that gap even just a little bit. So um, we at the Office of the Independent Monitor did a policy analysis um, at the end of the body-worn camera pilot project. We wanted to exist the, the, assess the existing policy and program design. We really had two questions. We wanted to know if officers and supervisors were adhering to the policy that was in place during the project, specifically around activation, reporting, and things like that. And then we wanted to know if any alterations were needed to the policy for the full rollout of, of the cameras department-wide, which is actually happening this year. They're sort of phasing it out. Um, phasing it in one district at a time throughout the city. And, you know, I could kind of point to these goals and questions because I want to make the point that we weren't, you know, we weren't conducting this kind of rigorous academic research with the goal of um, establishing whether or not body worn cameras contribute to complaints, uh, decreases in complaints. Uh, you know, we were doing really kind of simple applied research. We were coding reports, we were counting, uh, and the goal was really just to assess the policy of the department that we oversee. Um, so we reviewed supervisor use of force cover sheets for those 80 uses of force involving um, officers in District 6. Uh, and you know this is probably a very similar process in, in many of your jurisdictions. Whenever there's a use of force that meets a certain level of criteria uh, or a certain level of resistance, um, the officer has to inform their supervisor. And that supervisor, usually the sergeant, will come out and conduct an administrative investigation um, to deter sort of gather evidence and, and determine whether or not there may have been any particular potential um, policy violation or any misconduct. Uh, and so they write a narrative report that, you know, it could be anywhere from like one page to 15 pages long with their assessment, as well as whether they think that there's more investigation um, needed or if there were any training issues identified. Uh, so we use that start, usually the sergeant's assessment of whether or not the body-worn camera had been turned on. And so the policy had instructed supervisors that when you're writing these administrative reports, um, you should indicate whether or not there's body-worn camera footage available. Um, and then we looked at other relationships between um, officers and whether or not they activated body-worn cameras or whether or not they, they were likely to. We didn't find much, and so I'll, I'll sort of gloss over that second question and really focus on the first question. So we have a couple key findings here. Uh, the first is that body-worn cameras did not record a majority of uses of force in District 6 for various reasons. Um, so there were 80 uses of force in that time period. Uh, the 21 of them had been recorded on a body-worn camera, so about 26% of the total. And then we sort of looked at the reasons why some of the other um, incidents hadn't been recorded. And we'll, I'll get into the more detailed incidents in the next slide, but I think the, you know, this big kind of I think it's orange up there, a piece of the pie. 44% uh, of the uses of force were not recorded only because of the, the details of the policy, which said um, supervisors and officers working off duty are not required to wear body worn cameras. And so, huge policy gap uh, that sort of flagged to us that, you know, that that policy needed to change. And I think what we were seeing is that often sergeants, you know, theoretically, sergeants are not being supervisors on the street, but I think what we saw in reality is that they actually were, and they were getting involved in uses of force. Um, and then we have a very, very large off-duty sort of secondary employment program where the, um, police officers are employed at the, the bars and the clubs downtown and, and um, places where uses of force are likely to happen, um, sports stadiums, places like that. Um, so we were concerned about that. Um, and then, so, so let's get rid of those that those 35 that weren't recorded because of the policy. Um, and now we'll look at the other 45 where these are ones where we expected to be a recording under the policy that was in place at the time. About half of them actually were recorded. I'm sorry if it's confusing to kind of jump from the 80 to the 45. Um, but about a quarter of them weren't recorded for reasons that make a lot of sense. So if you're an officer, <laughs> new at uh, using the equipment and you see a fight break out over here, probably the first thing you're going to do is go break up that fight and not think about pressing the activation button, at least at first. And we knew that there had to be some muscle memory development and things like that. Uh, there were some user and equipment errors, so cameras getting stuck under lapels or wires getting knocked off during fights. Um, and there was one incident in which the officer, there. Uh, an, an incident was kind of wrapping up and everything was fine, so the officer turned his camera off and then there was a use of force. And, and then there were a small handful that we didn't know 
we didn't know why or we weren't we didn't know for sure if it had been recorded based on what was included in the um, the supervisor's summary report. Um, so we did look sort of descriptively at whether complaints and uses of force went up, went down, if there was no change. Now again, we're not this, we didn't use regression, we didn't, um, you know, propensity score matching, nothing like that. This is just looking at the pilot period in 2014 compared to the same period of time in 2013. So our pilot site in District 6, we actually saw complaints went up by 8%, uses of force went up by 11%. These numbers are kind of small, so, um, you know, we're talking about 10 additional complaints and uses of force. If we look at the rest of the department, um, complaints had gone up a little bit as well, but uses of force had actually gone down. And we can't really draw any conclusion from this, but we thought it was an interesting finding. Um, so we issued nine recommendations to the Denver Police Department while they were um, in the process of finalizing their body-worn cameras. So at the end of the pilot project, they took the cameras off the streets, they sent them back to Taser, and they worked on their policy. Um, and then they, you know, they did an RFP process, and now they're putting the cameras back on the streets right now. Um, so, you know, we thought they should provide additional training on activating the cameras prior to citizen contacts, um, evaluate potential equipment issues. Um, number three is probably our, our big recommendation here, deploy cameras to all uniformed officers who interact with the public, regardless of their rank and regardless of whether or not they're working off duty. Um, instruct officers to keep the cameras activated until the event actually concludes. Um, require citizen notification. I think just building from the, um, the findings of the Rialto study, um, we thought that notification would be pretty important. Um, require better documentation from supervisors, provide notice of disciplinary penalties, um, provide more details on privacy issues, which are a, you know, a very hot topic right now, um, and solicit officer and community input for future revision of the policy. So this is where I wish we had Maria and her team in there to help out on that side of it. Um, and you know, the, initially the, the department, so they, they did not issue any sort of formal response to any of the recommendations. Um, there was no documentation about what they were going to do. Um, and about eight months after we put that report out, they released a draft public policy for, uh, a, a draft policy for public comment on their website. They got some comments from the community. I think um, sort of outside of that process, they drew, it, it drew a lot of criticism from, you know, civil rights groups and, um, and advocates and even from our city council for not um, incorporating all of our recommendations and I think specifically the recommendation around outfitting supervisors and officers working off duty. So subsequently uh, in around the fall of last year the chief decided to um, to require sergeant so we didn't get all the supervisors but we got the sergeants which I think is important um, and officers were off working off duty to wear body worn cameras so they're still figuring out the details of um, how they're going to make that happen and, and um, getting the cameras out there. And, um, but that, that was an exciting change. So I've got a couple discussion points, but I think I'm, maybe I'll just leave them for the actual discussion. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Jennifer.